Hello, everybody. Welcome to Friends and Neighbors. I'm your host, Sandra O'Neill, and I am here with my fabulous friend <laughs> and longtime host of Friends and Neighbor, Sherry Tatum. Yes, it's I. I love it you. Is I. Yes, so, I love you too, well, darling. Well, you know, Sherry, you know, here at Friends and Neighbors, we strive to provide topics of discussion that will encourage, that will engage, and will impact. Mm -hmm. our community and yes. today is no different we have a guest with us today by lieutenant gary jones thank you for joining us uh, and thank you for having lieutenant me. jones has yes. quite the background <laughs> yeah. you have a degree a criminal justice degree from the university of north carolina i think central uh, north carolina, carolina and um you worked for the u.s department, department of justice, justice. Yes. and then you also uh, retired a senior lieutenant from the Federal Bureau of Prison. Prisons, yes, which yes. is wow. Oh, wow. But you know what? Above all of those accomplishments, what I um, read about you is you are known also as an advocate, an educator, and also a fighter and survivor. And you have authored two books. One is called Patient Versus Doctor, Misdiagnosis. And then also The True Character of a Man, which we're going to dive into. But first of all, um, we're going to talk a little bit about patient versus doctor. Okay. So tell us a little bit about this. What caused um, you to want to write this book? Um, it was back in 1998, I think. I was like 35 years old. I was a senior lieutenant, as you said. Uh, working at the Federal Correction Institution, Tallahassee, Florida. Yeah. Uh, you know, one morning I awakened and I had a terrible fever, about 104. Uh, I had, I was aching all over my body. I thought I had the flu or something. Mm -hmm. So when I went to the restroom, to the restroom, it felt like I was burning everywhere and I didn't know what was going on. Um, I was sweating profusely. And so I took my own set. I think, I think I took myself to the emergency room. I don't know whether my wife was there or not. I think I, you know, kids was in school. I took myself to the emergency room. Um, so when I went to the emergency room, uh, of course, they all would have to have a, a sample of your urine. And um, they asked, they said, what's wrong? I said, I'm hurting everywhere. I said, I can barely see. My back is hurting everywhere. And so uh, when they um, took the analysis and stuff, uh, they said, well, we have to this this the most embarrassing part, and I, I, I will hear this for 21 more times. Mm. Well, we have to test you for gonorrhea. Mm. I said gonorrhea. Oh my goodness. Well, you had the symptoms, you know. I'm like, I don't have gonorrhea, mm. you know. So when the test come back, um, it was they call it the worst urinary tract infections they ever seen. Mm. And so they put me on antibiotics, pain medication. And two weeks later, I was still having a urinary tract infection. It was an, I don't know whether or not the first urinary tract, tract infection actually went away or it was another one because I was still taking antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So I go back to the doctor. They say, yeah, you still. Of course, they're going to test me for gonorrhea again. So you went infection. to the doctor again. You went back. Yeah. So you went to the emergency room, uh, just completely shaking, just had yeah. some very embarrassing yeah. testing that yeah. needed to be done. Then yeah. they released you with antibiotics, and right. then you came back. But was right. that for the yeah. 21 times? Because you said uh, you had it for. OK, the 21 times was actually my last one. Uh, after 13 years, the 21st. Thir wait a minute. Wait. Yeah. wait so 30, 13 years, you had a urinary tract infection. Yeah, or that's I, I what was they getting, were calling it. Right. I, I was uh, getting urinary tract. Uh, oh 1998. My gosh. I think by the year 2000, I had already had five urinary tract infections. And that's all yeah. you kept being diagnosed that's with. Right. Did and you go uh, to the emergency yeah. patient? Um, go through okay. the whole thing right. every time, Gary. Right. And finally, uh, you know, one of the mercy room doctors said, "Well, okay, we will send you to a urologist." Mm -hmm. So I went to a urologist, he said, well, he's pretty young to be having urinary tract infection. We see this in elder people, and uh, you look good, you know, uh, you look like you're in pretty good shape. But I said, I keep on having urinary tract infection, and I don't know where it's coming from. Uh, and they asked me the famous question. Again. <laughs> uh, Mr. Yes. Jones, are you out there being promiscuous? Mm -hmm. I said, huh? I said, uh, I said no, I'm not. Uh, I said, is that the reason why you, you can't tell me what's going on? You don't know what's going on, so you can put the blame back on me? I said, no, we just, um, you're young, you're in pretty good shape, and we don't see this often. Like I said, we see this in elderly patients, and um, 
most of the time we see it in females. It's more common in females in, in than yes. having a man. Okay. So I went to a second opinion. They said, uh, no, you've been misdiagnosed. You don't have uh, you don't have a tract infection. You have what we call prostatitis, and that's the inflammation of the prostate. Mm -hmm. and so, that was causing uh, uh, that's everything what, else? Yeah, I mean. All this time, Gary? All this time. 13 that's, years? That's what they were thinking. Oh, my God. And this is the timeline. This is the beginning yeah. of the, this yeah, is the, the yeah, progression. This is, yeah. Yeah, this so we're still in, what, year one, year uh, two, two. Okay. of you trying to figure out. What's going on. Okay. And then um, I think oh. after the... Uh, that fourth, I want to say, because I moved to Atlanta in 2003, um, I think after the fourth year, I think I had like five or six urinary tract infections. Oh, in one year? Uh, no, I had three in one year. Oh, wow. And then uh, it seemed like each year I was getting one every six months. And the reply from the physician when you uh, would meet them would be? Uh, same thing. Same thing. And they put you on uh, antibiotics, mm -hmm. pain medication. A lot of water. Right, a lot of water mm -hmm. and cranberry juice mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So I said, uh, I want to get to the bottom of it. I want to know, is there anything that I was doing to cause the urinary tract infection? Mm -hmm. I need to know that. Because if I'm doing anything, I need to stop it. Mm -hmm. yes. and, he said, no. and then one of the guys, one of the second opinion said, well, you got, you know, uh, prostatitis. I said, information that, you know, but I said, does that call you in that track and fish? Well, prostatitis, prostatitis, I mean, prostatitis got the same symptoms as you in that track and fish. So I went back to the original doctor. They said, well, I told you, you know, uh, what you have and things of that nature. I said, well, uh, I need to know what's going on. So I moved to Atlanta in 2003 and I kept getting <clears throat> sick. So I seen specialists up here and they looked at me. Uh, Medical file said, Well, you know, they examined me again. They said, You had one of the worst urinary tract infections. I said, How many times y'all could keep telling me I had a worse urinary tract infection? I need to know where it's coming from. And we did some more embarrassing tests. Um, you know, they said, Well, we have to check your semen and stuff. And, you know, that was embarrassing. You know, I just. Mm -hmm. And, you're, and, and how did they, because I know this is a long-term 13-year uh, 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 journey, uh, uh, did they diagnose uh, you? When did they find out what the root cause was? Did you uh, end up at another doctor, yeah, another I, hospital? Yeah, or? I, um, after I left Atlanta, I think in 2006, mm -hmm. I flew up to John Hopkins University. I just knew okay. I was going to be seeing, you know, right. a real thorough check over. Mm -hmm. Dr. Walton in there, seeing the medical records. Uh, I agree with the rest of the doctor, but this time I think you need to stay on antibiotics for the rest of your life, and that'll stop the symptoms from coming. I said, okay, now they're taking me as a joke. You know, they're not really taking me serious. Oh, my word. And so um, I kept getting sick. I kept getting sick, you know. So by going up John Hopkins, that was my third, yeah, the third uh, specialist. No, the fourth specialist. Then I kept getting Are sick. Are you so yeah, frustrated yeah. at this point that yeah. you think, what the goodness yeah, is see, going they, on? You know, you know they're trying to convince me it was in my head, but the tests show otherwise. Right. And see, they kept, you know, my age, yeah. you know, because most people, at, you know, okay, they tell you at the age of 40, you need to start getting your prostate checked. I got sick at 35, so I'll get my prostate checked you twice a year. you ahead of that. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. you know. And, um, like I said, I was very disappointed with John Hopkins, and I'm not ashamed to say that. When he looked at the medical records, said you should take uh, oh, that's, that's, antibiotics that's, for yeah. the rest of your mm -hmm. life. And I said, they take me as a joke. So I was getting frustrated. So for a year or two, you know, when I got sick, I had enough antibiotics, enough pain, to, it's, pain it's medication. It's a wonder that did not really hurt you, really, all those antibiotics. Well, it hurt me. Because uh, it can cause so many uh, intestinal yeah. problems and weaken your immune system, and uh, other things can start. I and when did you, you feel system. like yeah. when did you get your true diagnosis? We, um, we have a short time here before yeah. the next break. Okay. Uh, uh, I went to uh, the Mayo Clinic mm -hmm. uh, uh, 2010, October 2010. I went to the Mayo Clinic and um, they said, Have you ever had an MRI or a CT scan mm -hmm. on your prostate? Mm -hmm. I said, No. They said, uh, Wow. You know, we've seen that you had a lot of urinary tract infections. Sometimes you have an abscess on that prostate and that can cause the urinary tract infection. But we want to be sure. So when they did the test, um, I think that might have happened in December, mm. uh, they found tumors, you know, on my prostate. So I had to come back and do some more tests. 
Um, so finally, it seemed like everything was on track. Right. I mean, I, I hate to say that yeah. you never want to find yeah. tumors in any part of your body. Yeah. But I imagine but you're, you were glad. Yeah. Yeah. Relieved and yeah. you're persevering yeah. through. As a matter of fact, um, when the doctor told me I had uh, prostate cancer, uh, a lot of people thought I would be upset. And I think my family was uh, kind of nervous and stuff sure. for me. It seemed like uh, relief. the relief, you know. Because yeah. this is what, know, after 13 you years. you finally got a diagnosis. Right. Yes, which you were persevering mm. through and right. persevering through. And you felt that yeah. um, dichot that yeah. per patient yeah. versus doctor. Right. Um, yeah, because see, a lot of people go to, you know, they don't, you know, they just take the doctor for what they say, right. and they don't ask questions, and they say, okay, the doctor said this, right. but and you go home, you still have Right, and that's where you step problem. in to say it's okay to persevere and right. continue to ask questions. So we are going to be right back. We need okay. to take a quick commercial break, but okay. we will be back with Lieutenant Jones, and we're going to dive deeper here on Patient versus Doctor and his next book. And we'll see you shortly. And being misdiagnosed. Yes. Well, welcome back to Friends and Neighbors. And I tell you, what a, what a powerful story yes. of fighting and surviving. And um, you're absolutely right, Lieutenant Jones. It's when you have that patient-doctor relationship, yeah. it's kind of like a, a dance. You know, the doctor, um, you mentioned in your book that doctors tend to be overworked. Yeah. They tend to be um, focused in so many distractions. Yeah. But you know, when the doctor walks into the patient room, he walks into a new world that's right. focused on that patient, right? right. That's what's supposed to supposed happen. To but the thing happen. about it is, they, because they're overworked, I think they walk in and they give a pat answer. Right. They give the, the first easiest thing right. instead of researching and find out because like we know 12 million people get my d misdiagnosed right. and which can do Gary as you know yeah. more harm than good because yeah. you're being treated for something yeah. that's not even really the problem and yeah. then you it, it because you have this problem yeah. then it starts breaking down other things right. and, and because someone didn't take the time to say right. wait a minute I can go a little step further than this and find out the answer right. yeah. and being big yeah. mis uh, diagnosed for 13 years is unacceptable yes. to me yes. and I almost died like I was saying uh, before yeah. the break I almost died in 2011 I had another urinary tract infection I just said okay the same routine antibiotics pain medication when I was in Orlando Florida went to the hospital they get I knew they would give me the same medication Later on that night, I was getting sick and sick. Um, my uh, fingernails were turning, I mean, inside fingernails were turning blue. I couldn't see the headache. So um, I asked my uh, fiance, I said, um, you know, which doctor did Tiger Woods go through in Orlando when he had that mishap with his wife? He said, health center. I said, take me over there. Mm -hmm. And so what happened when the doctor examined me, um, they told me that uh, my organs were shutting down and they couldn't do anything about it. So they had to call a kidney specialist a liver specialist in, and this is the story I really want to tell you. I want, just in a couple of seconds, I want to say, you know, when I was diagnosed with uh, cancer, and I knew I was gonna go through with the, taking the prostate out, I was telling them, they gave me a date, but in my mind, I knew I was gonna change my mind instead of going through with it. So when I almost died, you know, in 2011, on my birthday, in January 25th, 2011, when I almost passed, my organs started shutting down. And then I didn't hear no voice. I'm telling you that, you know, it came to me. So like, okay, it took this long to find prostate cancer. Now we almost to the end. And you getting ready to change your mind? Mm. And I knew that was the Lord talking to me. I didn't hear no audible voice and that like that. It came to me. And then I just went on, I said, yeah, I went on, I followed through with the surgery. Mm. Yeah. You know, yeah. what advice would you give to a patient nowadays yeah. uh, uh, when they go see the doctor? Wow. Uh, it, it, okay, the advice I give to a patient now when they go see the doctor, it's, it's, it's nothing wrong going to get a second opinion. You, you know, if you go to the doctor and the doctor says, well, well, we don't see anything wrong, 
and you know in your heart you're still hurting, something's going on. Just because they don't see it on test doesn't mean anything's not going be on. Be persistent. Yeah, be persistent. It's nothing wrong with going to a second opinion. Amen. It's not wrong with third opinion, fourth mm -hmm. opinion, fifth opinion, the one that diagnosed me. Mm -hmm. That is amazing, yeah. fifth yeah. opinion. Yeah. And I mean, and you educate, is that what you do? Oh, you yes. go out and you speak and you yeah. encourage people with yes. your life story. Yes. Could I ask you a question? Did anyone ever tell you to take probiotics? Uh, and, no. and no sugar because sugar no. feeds your inner tract and, and no. probiotics no. puts the good yes. bacteria back in the no. gut that you need to yes. fight no. your, for, to help your immune system. No one told you that. No, I had to find out years later. You know, I take it now. Yeah. You know, but mm -hmm. uh, taking too many antibiotics, I'm going to tell you like this, you know, I have a kidney problem. Yes. Mm -hmm. and uh, it can cause other things. Yes, it yeah. can. And so the medication they were giving me in the hospital wasn't working because my body had already got immune to all the antibiotics, and I was slowly dying. And were you working during this entire time uh, in no, the I Federal had, Bureau? Uh, or? It, it started off, I was working when I had a, those urinary tract infections for mm. a couple of years, then I retired. Yeah, because I know that you also wrote this book, The True Character of a Man, yeah. um, talking about the inside truth of the criminal yeah. justice and yes. with your background with that. I can only imagine yeah. having to go to work every single day fe uh, feeling miserable, uh, trying to get tired. answers, yeah. and then seeing what's happening within the prison because you also worked in the federal and the state yes, uh, levels. Yes. Share with us a little bit about the inspiration behind this book. Okay, uh, you know, my career started in 1987 sure. with D.C. Department of Correction. Mm -hmm. I was a correction officer and I'm going to go through this pretty fast. Yeah. Then I left to go to North Carolina. I worked at three state institutions as a correction officer. Then I became a case manager. Okay. Um, then, um, 19, January 1991, I started working with the Federal Bureau of Prison mm -hmm. down at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base. They had a federal prison camp on the Air Force Base in, in the Goldsboro, North Carolina. Uh, I became a lieutenant, and then I was transferred to Tallahassee uh, July 1995 as a senior lieutenant. But to go back, when I first started working through the system, uh, the prison system was always overcrowded. Mm -hmm. Always overcrowded. Mm -hmm. Every prison I went to was always overcrowded. What changed my life? In 1995, uh, I had just moved to Tallahassee, and a riot broke out. And the reason the riot broke out, because I think President Clinton was in office then, Janet Reno was the uh, attorney general, and they were the, trying to, to examine a uh, United States Sentence Commission that's set up by Congress, sent them out to do a study in reference to the crack and powder cocaine and the, the different sentencing. Mm -hmm. uh, the people that were doing powder cocaine would get a different sentence, and the people doing crack cocaine would give a different sentence. So the United States Sentence Commission came back with a study saying overwhelming evidence, 95% overwhelming evidence that uh, that law was affecting minorities more so than anything. Mm -hmm. And just, I'm just going to give you an example. I uh, just want to get a TV audience an example mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. happened. Yes. Back in the days, if you have 500 grams of powder cocaine, mm. it was about that much, and on street value, it was fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Now, if you have five grams a, a powder, I mean, a crack cocaine, and street value five hundred dollars, so the, most of the minorities was getting sentenced with the federal prison with just five hundred dollars worth of crack cocaine. So, in order to get the same sentence for powder cocaine, you had to have at least 500 grams of powder cocaine, and that equated to five years. That's, uh, that's $50,000, which equated to five years in federal prison. Mm -hmm. And a majority, you know, so when the United States Sentence Commission, which were made up of judges, came back and said this law, mandatory minimum sentencing law, when it came to crack and powder cocaine, it was affecting minorities more so than anything else. So, uh, President Clinton stated... So, are you saying they were getting a stiffer sentence? sentence. Oh, yeah. Five oh, yeah. years. Oh, definitely a stiffer sentence. Yeah. God knows, you know. And not only that, I don't care whether or not you even had a speeding ticket. You know, it's you were automatic... first-time offender. First-time offender. Yeah. But let me let the audience know this. Now, if you get stopped, it's up to the prosecutor and the DA to determine where you're going. So, minorities were getting stopped for the, the crap cocaine. And the DA said, okay, we'll send their case to the federal system, the federal court. We know they're going to get five years or more. Five years, 15, three life sentences or more. Mm. And we know, that, okay, November 1st, 1987, they, didn't, uh, they abolished parole in the federal system. But 
you send the people over here to the state, you know, they had the same thing, but they wasn't getting anything but probation. Mm. Or, you know, and right. that's what they were So the getting. inconsistencies of the criminal background yes. and the law, yes. and you mentioned that the emotional decisions that lawmakers yes. were making, is that right. where you're, yeah, that, you're, you're giving the example right. of that? Um, yes. Is it's that it. the yes. inside truth oh, that yeah. you talk about? Is right. that yes. it's, in uh, your book here? Yeah. And, and the reason I talk about it, because it changed my life in 1995. You know, like I said, President Clinton stated uh, uh, earlier in May that, uh, you know, they agree that, the, you know, the sentence was unfair. Mm -hmm. Janet Reno said, okay, we need to uh, uh, build more uh, uh, drug treatment centers. And so, you know, they was on the right track. Mm -hmm. And I told 1995, you know, they're supposed to be passing the law. Inmates were getting happy from first, that, you know, someone finally listened, you know, they were being over sentenced. And then they were gonna do retroactivity, which means that, you know, uh, you know, they could go, go back. back. They could go back, and a lot of people were looking forward to getting out. A lot of people were getting sentenced over 10 to 15 years. They could be automatic release. So, they, so they, Congress changed their mind and went back on their word. So they, uh, the, the so riots the, broke and out. And the prison yeah. life, of course, that brings yeah. out. So that that yeah. that's what you speak about, Chapter 21, the riots um, oh, yeah. in in Tallahassee that yeah. you were involved okay. in. But I, I uh, imagine uh, that you saw so many other. God, did, was, uh, but did it change anything? The riots? Mm -hmm. uh, did, no. did Congress? No, that would Did it make it worse? Yeah, it made it worse because see what happened. Um, Okay, let me take you back to Tallahassee. We got about two minutes. Yeah, okay, got okay. Two minutes. yeah. yeah. No, no, it didn't change anything. Mm -hmm. It got worse. worse. You know, That's they decided they wasn't going to change the law. Yeah. So that means every person you're working at is getting worse. Inmates mm -hmm. feel like I don't have any hope. They, you know, right. hey, I'm, ne I'm never going to get out. Right. And what is your heart's desire with both of the this book, The True uh, Character of a Man, and of uh, course, we have one minute or so. Uh, with these two books, we, the reason you write these are to yeah. educate and yeah. influence others. If you could just yeah. speak a little bit about that. Uh, on the misdiagnosis, I encourage anyone, mm -hmm. you know, if you have a problem, you know, and the doctors say they don't know what's wrong, it's nothing Keep wrong because doctors don't know everything. Okay. It's nothing wrong going to second well, opinion. Well, they call it practice, practicing yeah. medicine yeah. for a reason. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I encourage anyone, please go to another physician. Right. Just don't Maybe sit right there. Four. Right, until you find, and, and this particular book right here, it, it, it talks about the rights, you know, right. if you don't change the, uh, the law, the that, uh, laws, if you don't yeah. change the sentencing law, hmm. this is what might happen. A lot of people right. got hurt and killed. And how can uh, people yeah. reach you? How can people um, reach you to get these books? Um, well, those books? books right there, you can go to Amazon.com. Okay. Or if you were to walk into a Barnes and Nova, they don't have it. You just, uh, you know, they'll order it for you. Great. And then you're uh, on uh, social media, as I yes. gather, your uh, website. Do you want to tell yeah. us your hey, website? Uh, how can they reach, reach you, Gary? Uh, it's GaryLJones.info. Oh my goodness. Uh, then you have, uh, that's a personal one. Then you have uh, www.advocate, A D V O C A T E, numerical four, just J U S T I C E, dot O R G. So awesome uh, to have you here. Thank you thank for you. sharing your story with okay. us. Thank You're you welcome. for being a fighter yeah. and a survivor. Okay. And yeah, um, because, listen, that's uh, a lot of times that's what we have to be. Yeah. Right. We don't want to be, but we, we have, have to be. be. And thank you yes. so much for joining thank us. You. We will be right back. Ms. Sherry and I will have a few more minutes Thanks. with you. Enjoy this break, and thank you for tuning tuning in with us. Yeah. Hmm, maybe you can make retirement happen. After all, you made home ownership happen. Homeschooling yourself on loans, beefing up your credit score. So I'm pre-approved. You were like, yes, sorry. Color coding listings, ticking boxes, and flushing every toilet in a 20 mile radius. Home sweet home. You aced house hunter. Now get the tips you need to get on track at aceyourretirement.org. We're back. And it's just Sandra and I. We've got a little girl talk going on, right? I know. Just so does, what do you want to talk about? Yeah, We've got so two minutes. I have a quick question. Okay. Just a random question. Who do you, besides you. Oh, and besides you. Who is the most beautiful woman on TV, do you think? Oh, Laura, Laura Couch. Beyond oh. a shadow of a doubt. Yes. That's the sweetest, most beautiful, kind, 
woman on television that I have ever seen in mm. my life. I could just sit and watch and listen to her because she's so, what is it? Okay. <laughs> like, and welcome Chuck to the set. Yes, come on in. Back of Chuck. Come on Who in. Who is the most beautiful woman on television? Chuck. Yeah. No. I have welcome. A, I have an ulterior motive okay. for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I want this Stand sent by. to her. Sorry. <laughs> because we can I go on our get my book on. T I want to get about Britney's story. Well, it's us. We're back, Sandra and I, and we've got a little two minutes, just she and I together yes. talk a little girl talk. I love that. I, I love this too. time together. You got anything you want to talk about? You know, I was just randomly thinking, um, who do you think, besides you, is the most beautiful woman on television? Well, besides us. <laughs> Because, you know, yeah. beauty is more than the outside. Say, absolutely. It's the inside Side. and the out. Well, Laurie Couch, beyond oh, the shadow yes. of a doubt. I mean, she's tops in, in beauty, yeah. in kindness, in the word. Uh, she's a great mother. She's a great uh, wife. She has to travel. And, and she always looks so beautiful. I love her mm -hmm. hair. I love her makeup. I love the way she presents herself. If there's anybody, any woman that I would, if I were young again, I would copy her. Oh my goodness. You know how, and that's the biggest form of yeah, a compliment uh, you can get is someone wanting to be like yeah. you. Uh, she's so demure, so uh, uh, sweet and introspective, I, I think, and she's not brash and, uh, and she lets her husband do most of, of the talking, which is okay, okay. but I think, as far as beauty, she's got an inward and an outward beauty that I don't think could be matched. Mm. But you do too, uh, well, precious. No, I, no, well, <laughs> you know, I just think that it's awesome when God shines um, right through you and you just and glow it does with, with, his, her. Yes. with his radiance, right? Yes. And that's mm -hmm. what makes you. And she's an inspiration to so many, including I, me and yeah, you. I couldn't handle what she does. I mean, she's, she, she's just an awesome woman. And, and with other women, she's so unpretentious. Right. She's just she's there and she listens and oh, are we out of time already i, I wanted to are. talk some more we need to have some more girl talk i yes. was gonna raise my feet up yeah oh, oh if you got the remote well, again maybe. i'm telling you we're exhausted <laughs> hey thank you <laughs> see you thank next you. time friends